So we continue on with earthquake disasters. Okay, it's just to impress upon you the fact that earthquakes can occur in many places around the world. They are disastrous, and they can they can occur from a lot of different kind of fault movements, actually, too. This one happened to be a subsea earthquake here. Now, this was in Lisbon, Portugal, and this is actually modern-day Portugal. So this is uh, Lisbon as you see it today. Uh, but in 1755, it was leveled. Now, what you, what you have to consider is in 1755, Portugal was one of the world's superpowers. Literally, it is the country that went to the New World and established um, all of Brazil. And so they had colonies also in in uh, Africa as well. And so their, you know, their their nation spanned the globe more or less. And 1755 pretty much brought that to a halt. Um, so we're going to go on from here actually to 1755. After that, Brazil became an independent country and a few other ones became independent after that as well. Um, what did it look like back then? Well, we didn't have cameras back in 1755, but we know that there were woodcuts. And so the woodcuts will actually illustrate much of this uh, segment. And so you can see the, the priests are praying here and people running through the streets here and people for whom the buildings have collapsed and fallen upon them. You can see some legs sticking out from below a wall down here at the very bottom. And then a very common theme. What you see is these are stone or brick buildings that were toppled essentially by this earthquake, by the movement of that earthquake. And then on top of that, there were fires. And so fires are very commonly something that you get after an earthquake. Even in modern day earthquakes, they often have fires afterwards. And of course, it is a time when you can least expect to be able to drive down a street to be able to get a fire truck into an area to put out the fires. So it's an issue. It's an issue with how we build our infrastructure. So here you can see this is what happened in Lisbon in 1755. Over here on the right-hand side, by the way, that is the uh, the the holding, the, the colonial power that was uh, Portugal here. And so you can see that they hold the Azores. They held the Canary Islands. Uh, there were parts that were part of the uh, Portuguese Empire uh, in Central Africa, that the Congo there, and then also Mozambique, and then some islands that were actually all the way over, I think it's East Timor was part of the Portuguese Empire as well. And so several islands off the coast of uh, of Africa. And so, but this is the ancient kingdom of Portugal. Uh, they had they were they competed with the Spanish, uh, so both of those kingdoms were enormously wealthy, more wealthy in fact than what the French and the uh, the English were at that time. Um, in 1755, here's another woodcut that's been colorized for a plate, and you can see the effects of that of that earthquake here. Even the waves in the port. Uh, were generated by that earthquake. So there was a tsunami associated with this earthquake that ran into the, the harbor. And some of the ships caught on fire, even, you can see here. And then also the fires on the uh, on the mainland there uh, as well. So even the port was affected by this. Now, there's two different kinds of waves that you can get, ocean waves, let's say, from a from a tsunami. Now, one of those, of course, is the tsunami itself, which rushes on shore pretty, pretty rapidly. You know, it can be fairly rapid anyway. And it's just a massive wave that piles the water on shore farther and farther on shore. So it can go quite a, a distance in shore. Um, the other style of wave that you can get from an earthquake is you have to imagine this. Um, if you had a glass of water and you shook the glass of water, it would the level of that water would tilt as you began to shake it. And so that's another type of wave called a seiche. Seiches occur when you have confined bodies of water that weren't necessarily affected by a tsunami. Now, it was a tsunami in this case as well, but a seiche could actually cause the water level to shift uh, within a harbor as well. And so that's, I think that also happened here in Lisbon at this time. 
although they have mapped the the tsunami associated with this, or at least what they think was the tsunami associated with it. They've 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 been able to identify what they think was the epicenter for that 70, uh, 1755 earthquake. So let's go on. And uh, here's another woodcut uh, shows you again uh, the carnage going on in the port toppling ships, uh, you know, capsizing ships, and then also the fires that are onshore and some of the buildings that have been uh, crushed there as well. Uh, toppled, in fact, or uh, pancaked is another term that we use for these sorts of buildings. And we'll look at that. Actually, pancaking is very common in uh, modern structures, in fact. So here are some details that we have been able to piece together. Not we, but, you know, geologists have been able to piece this together. Mm, maybe 10 years ago, something like that. From the historical record, they know of some of the waves and how they traveled across the seas. So you even get waves pretty much on the other side of the Atlantic uh, from this uh, earthquake. And so you can see where the, the epicenter was just off the coast, so in the red region there, just offshore from the Iberian Peninsula. That's Portugal that's on the west side of the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, magnitude 8.5 to 9. Of course, that has to be estimated because they didn't have any seismometers back then. They didn't have any seismic stations. 40 minutes after the earthquake occurred, it was the tsunami that came in and destroyed the, the port and the Seich, you know. Um, it, it was the capital city of the Portuguese Empire. They have estimated that there are roughly 34, uh, 30 to 40,000 people were killed in that event. And so we're going to move on to the next uh, major one. So, okay, so we know that earthquakes can topple superpowers. Okay, so that's something to keep in mind. Earthquakes occur all around the world, and there are a lot of places that are more prone than others to having earthquakes. But I will point out that recently there was an earthquake in Virginia. Even New York City has experienced earthquakes. They're not a seismic. And even Missouri is not a seismic. We're going to look at that as well. But for now, we're going to look at this one. This is Tamales Bay, actually, here. Uh, you see the body of water at the north there. In fact, that's the Point Reyes uh, Peninsula out here. It's kind of triangle in shape. So that's the northern end of the Point Reyes Peninsula up here on the left-hand side. And I kind of show you what the San Andreas Fault Zone looks like. It's a mile wide. It's huge. And all of the rocks in between one side of the bay and the other side of the bay where it, it leads out to that peninsula, those rocks have moved for at least 16 million years. And so they're mostly crushed in there. So there are some crushed rocks. And so when you crush rocks like that, you turn them into breccias. Yeah, that's the breccia is the rock type that we talk about when we talk about fault zones very commonly. They call it fault breccia. And then also there's just rock that's been so ground down by fault movement that they call it rock flower. And so there are sediments associated with this earthquake as well. And the arrows on this, you can see where the San Andreas Fault Zone is located. The arrows indicate the movement along that fault or the relative motion that occurs within the fault zone. Okay, so not necessarily on the sides of that, but all throughout that fault zone there was movement in some of the major earthquakes that have occurred along the San Andreas Fault. The last one that was a super major earthquake out there was 7.9, 1906. April the 18th, 1906. Now, it was a populated place at that time, but in fact, most of the people were not killed by the earthquakes and buildings falling. San Francisco was one of the major cities that was hit by this earthquake, and um, most of the people died from the fires as it turns out. And uh, there were four, almost half a million people were homeless afterwards. So these are some of the things that we have to reckon with because we know that these earthquakes will occur again. Okay, it's not a matter of if they will occur, but when will they occur? And so it's very important to keep your fingers on the pulse of the Earth. <laughs> That's why we have the U.S. Geological Survey out here monitoring earthquakes around the entire world. On the right-hand side, you can see where I, th I think they've estimated where this epicenter was. They don't have a precise location on it, but that's going to be pretty close to where it was. So it was in between 
the Golden Gate Bridge and the Farallon Islands, which were a little bit farther out to the west there. So it was pretty close. And on this, I've actually drawn the trace or the pathway of the San Andreas Fault through here. And so the Point Reyes Peninsula is up here at the north end of that sort of Google Earth uh, image, this satellite image here. And so you can see the triangular sort, sort of shaped uh, land to the west of the fault zone here. And so the reason I even tell you about that is because the, the Point Reyes Peninsula jumped 20 feet to the north in that earthquake. 20 feet, that thing actually moved. It was a 7.9 earthquake, massive earthquake. And so San Francisco is just on the opposite side of that fault zone, on the east side of that fault zone on a block. I think the, to the west, it's called the Salinas block. And to the right, that's part of this. I think it's a San, San Francisco block. Uh, there's like five or six different fault blocks in there, actually. So it's pretty complicated when you look at all the structural features, the geologic features that uh, constitute that part of California. Down here at the bottom down here, you can see the uh, Monterey Bay and you can see Monterey Canyon heading out into the ocean there as well. So this is a Google Earth image here that shows you uh, Central California pretty much. And so Santa Cruz uh, uh, is, we're going to talk about another uh, earthquake here in just a little bit. And it was pretty close to where Santa Cruz is, which is at the north side of Monterey Bay. Two different epicenters for the 1906 earthquake and the 1989 earthquake. So we'll talk about the 1989 soon enough here. So that's the 1906 earth, uh, earthquake location and uh, in San Francisco Bay uh, area. And so this is Olima Valley. And so that is where the Point Reyes Peninsula comes on to the mainland of California there. And here you can see an early photograph, 1906, for where one of these fences had been offset. Okay, so that's not 20 feet quite, but that's probably about 15 feet, 10, 10 15 feet there. And so in the in this uh, valley, of course, it's not it's pretty sparsely populated, and so there are not too many people killed here. And of course, you wouldn't have the fires here so much either, right? Because the dense population, you get you know wood burning stoves, coal burning stoves, and even natural gas was piped throughout the city of San Francisco at that time. San Francisco, I have to tell you has burnt to the ground probably about seven or eight times, okay? The phoenix is the bird that is the symbol of that city because they've had to rebuild so many times. Uh, but here you can see evidence for that fault movement in Olima Valley. Now, the next couple of photographs here are pretty astonishing. Uh, not only did the earthquake occur and topple buildings, then the fire started. And so the conflagration, in fact, there were... Um, Federal troops that were in this area that were, I think they were at Fort Funston, and they were called into the city to be guards. Essentially, um, it's like the National Guard you would call up for a natural disaster. Well, these were federal troops that they brought into the city, and they had orders to stop anybody from cooking uh, on wood or coal or anything like that, or any outdoors, because if that were to get out of, and it happened anyway, of course. And so the the conflagration that occurred after this killed most of the people here. And uh, what you see here is that smoke rising up from the city as it was burning after that earthquake in on, in April 19, 1906. Uh, here's a couple of gentlemen down here in the bottom part walking along one of the main streets in the aftermath of that conflagration and the the horrible fire that, that occurred after 19, after the earthquake in 1906. Now the next one, this photograph, I think this is down Lombard Street. And so uh, Lombard Street has the reputation of being the crookedest street in the world, right? So it's because it zigs and zags downhill. But this is a place on Lombard Street where you can see some of the buildings were made out of uh, bricks and the bricks had collapsed and, and fallen down into the street here. And people were out watching the conflagration at a distance here not knowing that they probably should have been running at that time away from the fire. And so what you see here is a, uh, you know, throngs of people out, you know, being gawkers essentially out in the street watching what's going on in another part of the city here. Um, but it shows you the devastation from just the, the masonry, the, the front uh, of these buildings had collapsed. 
um, in some of them. Here's a tragic scene where you see some horses were killed by bricks that had fallen into the street here. Um, 1906 again, so not far over 100 years ago, so 115 years ago. Um, this is a colorized version of a postcard that was made after the, the fire and the, the earthquake, of course. And so they've colorized the flames here for dramatic effect here. But um, some of that may be artistic uh, talent, but certainly the smoke itself rising up from above that is a real event. So some of the stories that went along with this in 1906, that was where it was after the the 49ers was the time when much of California was populated by Americans. And in fact, it was after that that the Americans staged a revolution and uh, took California and formed what they called the Bear uh, Republic. Uh, and they made their own country called California for a California or Republic of California for a while from the Spanish, actually. So the Spanish had held this. And so um, it was, you know, Northern California here was... Uh, pried away from the hands of the, the Spanish, and it became American in 1951, I think it was, was the actual, uh, they entered as a state in 1951. But there was all that gold that led the Americans out there, and actually people from around the world came here. It was before the Panama Canal was built. It was a time when people had to be on sailing vessels and sail all, all the way around South America, to get to California here. And so when they did that, you can imagine this, right? So here's, let's say you were in Boston or if you were in someplace like New York City, you would board a vessel in order to be a prospector in California. And you would sail around the roughest seas in the entire world, around Cape Horn. And then you would sail up from Chile all the way north, maybe stopping once or twice, you know, to reprovision or, or to stop at a port of call. And then eventually you'd get to California here. I probably took about two months or three months, perhaps sometimes. And so people who landed in California in the Marina District, where you would dock your ships at, a, at one of the wharfs there. And um, people got to California and there were people that were just enormously wealthy from trading, from the gold fields themselves. And of course, there's a, a part of human nature that is extremely greedy, right? Now, imagine if you were a sailor on that vessel, not one of the prospectors that had paid to go here. Uh, the sailors got here as well, and they said, to heck with this. I'm not going to earn 25 cents a day to be a sailor, to sail back from the richest place in the world right now. And so most of the sailors jump ship. And they, they landed, you know, they call this the Barbary Coast, you know, of North America. This is the Barbary Coast. They got off the ships. And what do you do with all those ships then? The ships were like piled up relics. And so some of them, they turned into housing. Some of them, you know, they jack them up and they bring them on shore or whatever, you know. And some of them, they decided, I was like, well, to heck with this. Let's just go ahead and sink these things. And so they sank a lot of the the ships there. And they also filled them with dirt, fill dirt, and made new land out of it, right? So there's some extra real estate that they were able to build out of old ships. And that area today is called the Marina District in San Francisco. So the Marina District, you pay attention to this. We're going to get to this. The Marina District is full of old sailing vessels that were filled with dirt. And that area is still there in San Francisco today. And it's a source for a lot of earthquake damage. And we'll get into why in a little bit here. But this is the conflagration here. In 18, uh, yeah, 1849, people jumped ship. And so uh, California had a lot of this mineral wealth from the mountains of the Sierra Nevadas. The gold, the gold fields were in the Sierra Nevadas. They brought that gold back to San Francisco and lived like kings in San Francisco. So 1906, there were a lot of rich people that lived in San Francisco. They had their own metropolitan, well, they had an opera, San Francisco opera. And then so there's all these mansions and things like that. So very wealthy people lived in San Francisco and some unsavory, <laughs> crazy pirate sort of folks who uh, as well. And so um, here you have, you know, these beautiful buildings in 1906 had already been built, many of them. In 1906, 
They even had Enrico Caruso. Okay, so you guys are familiar with rock stars, and I don't really even know who the rock stars are today, sorry. <laughs> but I know in the rock, rock stars of my day, like Jackson Brown or whoever, you know, uh, the who, you know, um, in that day, Enrico Caruso was the rock star, okay? He was a, an opera singer, and he experienced this earthquake. He was staying at a hotel in San Francisco, at about four o'clock in the morning, he was thrown out of bed by the earthquake and he had his, his, his valet there to help him pack up. And of course, everybody was getting out. And so he put all of his clothes and everything and packed it away. He was ready to get it, get the heck out of San Francisco after this earthquake. And he was sitting on his chest out in the middle of one of the streets in San Francisco. And of course, some people wanted to come along and steal his trunk. Said, no, 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 get out of here. Get out of here. You know, it's like, of course, I don't think he actually spoke English, but he, he was a famous opera singer. And so, um, he was guarding his own stuff here, you know, in the streets of San Francisco while this conflagration was going on elsewhere in the city. Um, in 1906, the, the city was burning. And there was a mint, one of the U.S. mints. The wealth of the United States at that time was in one of the mints. There was one in, in Philadelphia. There was one in Denver. And then there was one in San Francisco. And so this is where they would mint money, and they kept the gold. Now, that building was right next to this conflagration. So as all the buildings around it were beginning to burn, the guy who was the director of the mint rushed down to the mint and the mint is built. So there's a, a sort of a, tr a triangular sort of building, right? And in the middle of that is a courtyard and they had a well in there and they began to pump water everywhere and they kept the, the entire mint this was the time when the gold standard was still in effect in the United States. We no longer have that gold standard. But at that time, if that building had caught on fire, it would have crippled the American economy. As it turned out, the director for the Mint saved the Mint, and he made it possible for the Mint to actually survive the earthquake and then also the fire afterwards. And so the earth, the United States did not go bankrupt after this event, which, you know, to his credit, he's the one person who saved the mint <laughs> in this case. You can see the conflagration there. Let me show you a little bit more about uh, where things are out here. I used to live out here. I, I was working for the U.S. Geological Survey at Menlo Park, which is in the Bay Area. And I actually lived in Mountain View, which was in the South Bay area on the peninsula itself. So on the peninsula, the San Andreas Fault runs the length of it pretty much. And then it runs into uh, the inland areas of California, south of Monterey Bay. But here is on the left-hand side, you can see where they've sketched in the San Andreas Fault. Well, that's looking to the south there. And that goes through a little area called uh, Daly City. So Daly City is where the Santa, San Andreas Fault comes and runs out to sea there, and then it comes back on shore where uh, Point Reyes joins up with Marin County, they call it, um, in, nor in north of the Bay Area there, uh, so in North Bay Area. So here you can see a muscle rock down here, actually. Those are those rocks down along this rocky coastline, and that's pretty much where the San Andreas Fault runs out to sea. You can see on... But anyway, you can see that that is where the fault traces across here and you can actually see the shaking. And so the shaking map here on the right hand side is one of the ways that they can estimate the damage. Well, the damage actually causes you to be able to estimate what the magnitude of that earthquake was. And people estimate it was like a 7.9, pretty large earthquake. This is that same area today. Um, this is looking at some of the little pink houses that are in Daly City. Often thought that maybe John Cougar Mellencamp was thinking about that when he was writing his song, Little Pink Houses. But this is an area where there's a huge landslide or a landslip, they call it. And, um, it is a place that's been carved and that's where the San Andreas Fault runs out and into the sea here. That's looking, uh, down valley now. And so you can see where that landslip goes out. And so the, the fault kind of runs off to the right hand side of that image here. And the bottom uh, panoramic image here is looking from the bottom down there, looking up. And so you can actually see the cliffs up 
where that landslip is. Well, that landslip was related to fault activity where the fault goes out to sea here. It was the source for the the, the slumps and slides that occur here. Those are called mass wasting events, by the way. But this is what you would call a slump. And so this is a slump scarp, in fact, around the back of this area here. Uh, so that is at Muscle Rock on the south side of the uh, of the uh, San Andreas Fault there, uh, and the west side of the San Andreas Fault. Here you can see where the epicenter was in 1989. So the mountain Loma Prieta is shown at the arrow here. Just to the west of that, there's a little red star where the epicenter was for Loma Prieta. Now I've hiked to that area. There's a state park in this area called the Forest of Nicene Marks, and it's Got tons of redwood trees in there, big, giant, you know, 100-year-old redwood trees or more. And so it's an area that is very wild down there. And Loma Prieta is a pretty tall mountain, about 3,000 feet high almost, or 2,800 feet high. That's, that's almost 3,000 feet high. Um, that is where the earthquake occurred. Now, I want you to see, you can trace on here where the San Andreas Fault runs to the north, and you can see where it runs out at Muscle Rock there. Now, in 1989, from that earthquake epicenter, this is the one that they call the, the World Series earthquake, <laughs> if you're not familiar with it. In 1989, the World Series was being played between the San Francisco Giants and the Oakland A's across the bay there. And so, you know, it was just a short commute for them. But here it is in October, October 17th. The World Series had just begun. And I, I don't even remember what uh, uh, inning it was in. It was like the sixth inning or something like that, fifth or sixth inning. And uh, and then the earth began to shake. And I remember that. Bro I love baseball, right? So I, I'm watching this broadcast on TV, and all of a sudden it's like, you're hearing Vin Scully call this game, and all of a sudden it's like, uh, it looks like, and all of a sudden everything goes to static at the time. Um, there's some great stories about this, actually, from people who were working that stadium. There was one guy up on the lights of that stadium who was thrown around by that earthquake, you know, and so the earthquake is like moving him around. He thought he was going to lose his life from that. As it turns out, the stadium had this huge crack that developed in it, with about a three or four foot, uh, you know, break in the in the stadium itself, and it could have happened that there could have been hundreds of people killed in that event, but the stadium held and didn't fall down. It looked like one of the upper decks would have collapsed and fallen into one of the lower decks. There didn't happen, thank goodness, you know. Um, but what did happen were a lot of other tragedies, as it turns out. Now, um, one of the bridges in San Francisco, not the Golden Gate Bridge, but the Bay Bridge, runs from San Francisco to Oakland. Uh, the Golden Gate's on the north end of San Francisco here, and it runs over to Marin County. Uh, but the Bay Bridge runs from here in San Francisco over to Oakland, and that's a picture of it over here. And there were a few people killed there from that impact, and so uh, from that um, that earthquake what happens is they have two lanes on the bridge. So there's an upper lane and a lower lane there. And part of it, when it was wobbling from that earthquake, it pulled it apart. And so some of the pins that held the upper deck sheared and then the upper deck collapsed into the lower deck here. And so there were cars that were actually, they made their way down into the lower deck. So one deck had headed one way and the other deck headed the other way. And uh, so you can see a car stopped on the thing. To, fortunately, it, some of them were teetering right on the edge, too. Uh, there were also some some vehicles that were smashed. And I think there were two or three pieces that collapsed. And so it cut all the traffic out of San Francisco. In order to get to San Francisco, you had to make your way all the way around the north end of the bay or all the way around the south end of the bay uh, to get there or across some of the other bridges that cross uh, the bay a little bit farther south, so the San Mateo Bridge, and then uh, I forget the name of the other bridge down here, but it's a little farther to the south here. But the Bay Bridge is one of the major hubs, uh, one of the major transits for uh, people who work in the city but live in the East Bay sort of area. So this is, uh, there were only 63 people here. It's a miracle that were only 63 people killed here, uh, but there were almost 4,000 people who were injured. Um, if you watch... 
ESPN at all. I love sports, but you know, baseball is really my favorite. And NCAA, you know, okay, I'm from the University of Kansas, so I love that. Kansas is already out of the tournament this year, so I care a little bit less about NCAA this year now. But I still love watching sports on TV, and so if you ever watch uh, ESPN, you may be familiar with the series they call 30 for 30. And there's one about this, and then there's also several other documentaries that talk about this. Um, this is the next image here. You can see one of the highways that was in Oakland. So this is even farther away from San Francisco. But one of the things about California is that land is very, very expensive there. The houses are very expensive, but the land is even more expensive because, well, there's 8 million people that live, well, 12 million people that live in the Bay Area right here. There's 20 million that live in, in Los Angeles, right? But 12 million live in the, in the Bay or 12, 13 million people live in the Bay Area here. And because land is so expensive, they built the highways back in the 1970s and 1960s out of concrete, of course, and they built them in elevation. And so when those things began to shake, and this is a lot like the Bay Bridge where they had one lane heading one direction and the other lane heading the other way. Well, the ones heading to the, to the south, I think, were on the upper deck here, and the ones heading to the north here were on the lower deck and this is a, a view looking to the north here. What happened was the whole thing pancaked like this. And there were semi-trucks caught in between the layers of that highway. That's called the Nimitz Freeway. They've rebuilt that since then so that it no longer is an elevated freeway like this. It's actually on ground level. They didn't realize the risk when they had actually built this structure. You can see that the lower level didn't pancake, but the second layer pancaked in this situation. They call it pancaking when a building collapses like this. And so one floor onto another floor. In this case, you could still get underneath of it in many places, but if you were unfortunate enough to be on the lower deck of that freeway. You could have been crushed. Now here's the heroism, uh, the heroism that goes along with this story. Uh, they immediately called EMS. You know, there were cars trapped in there and everybody all of a sudden realized it's like, that's the lower deck. That's the upper. Oh gosh, you know. And so people were able to get off of the upper deck, mostly unscathed. And there were about 60, you know, 50 some odd people that were killed in this area. And there was just a, a short segment of the Nimitz Freeway that collapsed like this. Um, in 30 for 30, I think, or one of these other documentaries, they talk about doctors who actually had to crawl in between those layers and they would have to get into some of the vehicles. In one of those vehicles, there was like an eight-year-old child who was trapped. He couldn't get his leg out and they couldn't extract his leg and it was broken. They had to amputate his leg right there in the freeway, not knowing if another aftershock would cause the whole thing to shift and kill everybody that was in there. Um, that's the sort of heroism that happened that day. These are people who know how to pitch in when there's a natural disaster. They know how to help other people if they in any other way can. And so I've heard interviews with that doctor and he told us about this horrific event, but it saved that child's life. Um, better to be alive than dead. Um, here's another image of the Nimitz Freeway. And here's one of the heroes walking up for the upper deck here, right? You know, uh, they had cranes to try to, to help lift uh, some of this to remove part of it. Uh, but um, that, you know, that was much later. Um, in the next slide, this is pretty close to where I lived in Santa Cruz. I lived in Santa Cruz for a short period of time in a little town called Aptos, just, just to the... I'll be to the east of Santa Cruz slightly. Santa Cruz is at the north end of the of the uh, Monterey Bay area. So this is really close to the epicenter. We're about two miles away from the epicenter right here. And there was one house. <laughs> oh, this is actually pretty close to the street, there, the, the road that I lived on. I lived on Redwood Drive. And a Redwood Drive, you have to drive through the Redwoods, of course, as you might expect. And that's state forest you can see off in the distance down here. And those are Redwood trees down here. And that's one of the houses that was around the corner from me, about a, less than a mile away, about half a mile away. I did not live here when this thing occurred. I lived here about 10 years after that. Um, and so this house is the only house, in fact, that came off of its foundation. A lot of recommendations that they do for like structures. One of them is that you want wooden structures to be tied to their foundation so that, A, 
Um, they're bound together so they don't slide off of the foundation. So they, they put cables in these things. They try to tie in the hot water heaters because if you have an earthquake, you may have no water for days. And so you have to make use of the hot water heater. And you also don't want 500 pounds of water <laughs> slamming down, you know, in your house at that time, moving around also, you know, because you could get killed by a hot water heater. But the hot water heater may be your lifeline to uh, to, to surviving an impact, you know, this sort of earthquake, uh, the impacts of an earthquake like this. So this is the Loma Prieta 1989 earthquake again. And this is what it looked like in San Francisco now. This is in the Marina District where they built over those wooden ships and they put all this fill material in here. One of the things that happens when you put fill material in and you begin to shake it and it's actually water saturated, first of all, the water may may escape. And then the next thing that happens, of course, is the foundations immediately settle into that fill material. That fill material is unstable. And so when it goes the bottom layer very commonly went in many of these buildings. And so what you see here is another type of pancaking where the bottom layer has collapsed and the top layer was kept solid in this case. And so that is in the Marina District. Now, Marina District, because of the fill material that's in here, it went through a process called liquefaction. So the sediments that normally would be solid, <laughs> earth, <laughs> uh, become liquid when you shake them. Yeah, you can do that. You've seen this probably at the beach. You can shake your feet when you're at the beach. And next thing you know, you can sink in up to your thighs in, in quicksand, essentially, is what you're making. And that's kind of what this is right here. It turns the sediment here into quicksand. And so the bottom layer and the foundation have collapsed in this situation here. It would have destroyed that building. Um, here's an example of liquefaction here. Here's a bunch of hippies that are in a... Uh, a sand pit and they're moving around so you can see outside of the sand pit where the sand is maybe still saturated with water but they're not shaking it around it's solid and dry there but where you shake it around it has that appearance of water in fact it looks like wax almost and so these guys are in here having a good time but they're actually causing the liquefaction and they're actually standing in a a pit of quicksand here <laughs> Obviously, I think they're able to stand on some sort of solid ground down below that quicksand here. But that is what quicksand is like. Um, so that's called liquefaction, that process by which you can fluidize substances that normally would be solid. So the word we use for substance that substances that are normally solid but can be turned to a liquid, we, we call that thixotropic. Thixotropic. In other words, you can take a solid it may be saturated with water and you begin to shake it and you can turn it into a fluid. And so that's the process called liquefaction. That can occur in many earthquake settings. Actually, it occurs around the world. In fact, it's even occurred in Missouri. I'll, I'll tell you that. Um, so that is liquefaction. Um, here's another building that's uh, been pancaked. This was in 1985, Mexico City. I recall when this occurred. I think I was a senior in, in my uh, geology program at the time. Not only did the building collapse in the back, but in the front up here, that front building next to where it says Mara Mara uh, on the lower part here, uh, and everybody's looking at it, those are a whole series of layers that have, have not only pancaked, but then they've been hinged. And so the whole lot of them has collapsed. And so you can see one floor, two floors, three floors, four floors, five floors. There are six floors in the front part of this. You can see the the back building did better by only partially collapsing on the lower floor there. Tragic the loss of life here. 9,500 people died. 30,000 were injured, 100,000 homeless here. That's uh, 1985. In 1980, 1994, there was a major earthquake in California. It was at a place called, uh, it was in the San Fernando Valley. I think they called it the... Uh, Oh, gosh, the name escapes me right now, but I'll, I'll put it up on the, on the screen up here, here above somehow. Uh, but it was in the San Fernando Valley. I think it was the Loma. It wasn't the Loma Prieta, but Loma, that was the 1989 earthquake. Almost a year, and not quite to the day or anything like that, but a year after the 1994 earthquake in Los Angeles and San Fernando Valley. It wasn't Simi Valley. It's somewhere up north of uh, of, of uh 
Hollywood in that area. Uh, but it was a major earthquake, and it was like a very costly earthquake, but it didn't take quite so many lives. Um, in 1995, there was a major earthquake in Japan, and this earthquake at Kobe. Kobe is one of the historic capital areas of Japan, and it's a center for Shinto uh, religion. It is a um, an area that experienced an earthquake in 1995, and you can see on the left-hand side where it toppled another one of these two-layered uh, highways. The lower layer in this case was okay. The upper layer on a single pedestal flipped over on its side, and most of the vehicles rolled off or were thrown off of that impact. Again, here also in the distance, you can see the smoke rising up from the fires in the Kobe 1995 earthquake here. The photo on the right-hand side is more to illustrate the sort of fault movement that occurred that caused that earthquake to occur in the first place. You can see how the concrete is broken here in the foreground, uh, and that's the sharp edge on this thing. And you can see how one side is slid up relative to the other side. Well, here, let me do it right here. So one, one side is going up relative to the other side. You're going to know that later on as a reverse fault. And so that's a reverse fault in which the hanging wall, which is on the right-hand side, has moved up relative to the foot wall, which is on the left-hand side. Those are terms you're going to become familiar with pretty soon here, actually, within the next week or two when we talk about structural geology. But that is, in fact, a reverse fault right here. Beautiful photograph to show you what can happen. The tragedy, of course, is this is a magnitude 7.3 and there was 6,400 people killed in this uh, in that earthquake. Uh, in 2003, this is before the Banda Aceh earthquake, there was an earthquake in Bam, Iran. And uh, so Bam, Iran is in the southern part of Iran, the ancient Persian kingdom. And um, that earthquake killed 30,000 people. And in looking at this image here, you can only see part of one building, maybe part of two buildings that were still standing, and then there's a, a major one one building that was, almost went through it unscathed here, but every other single building in here collapsed. And so they build their buildings out of concrete block and uh, plaster and things like that, and so when these things begin to shift, if they're not reinforced, they're going to collapse and, and drop, and it's going to kill people. And so that's what you get with um, uh, structures made out of stone. And um, so... That's one of the issues. Uh, this is just, you know, in, in the uh, Muslim culture, uh, the dead are supposed to be buried on the same day that they died. And here they are pulling out some of the bodies out of the remains of these buildings. And so it was a very tragic event. Um, this is to show you what the cultural implications were from that, that earthquake. What you see in the distance here in that panoramic uh, view at the top up here, that's called a, the citadel. Now, the citadel has been there since about 1100 or maybe even earlier, about 1000 um, A.D., maybe earlier than that even. Uh, it was on a hilltop, and they built essentially a castle up on top of this hilltop, a palace, and... It was a fortification as well, and so you could defend it easily. And so uh, in the ancient Persian kingdom, that was a major sort of site. And at that time, in fact, uh, you can see where Baum is down here in the map down below. And it shows you a few of the routes that are in the Silk Road that was a major trading road at that time. The West had a demand for silk, and the East would supply it from China. And so silk moths and things like that couldn't be raised elsewhere. And so they had to get the silk, this beautiful, luscious fabric from China. And so it had to. And so Marco Polo was one of the guys who went on the Silk Road with his uncle and his father in order to trade for silk and bring that material back. Well, Marco Polo stayed in China for a number of years, but he actually got to see the Citadel. The 2003 earthquake shook it to the ground. This place is really prone to a lot of earthquakes. Southern Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Nepal, Bhutan, northern northern India as well, and actually the Tibetan Plateau again. And then all of China pretty much are subjected to a lot of earthquakes. 
This is in Pakistan in 2005, just a year after the Banda Aceh earthquake that caused the major tsunami, killed a quarter of a million people. Here you can see one layer, two layers, three layers, four layers, five, six, seven, maybe eight story building that had completely pancaked every layer in between here. And there were 18,000 people killed in this event, not just in this city. I, this was a lot, Islamabad that had this, suffered the great, great expense, uh, the great fatality and loss of life here. And you can see how crushed the buildings that were parked at the bottom here. Um, so people were searching through the debris, trying to find the survivors, and also trying to peel uh, the the folks who were whose lives were taken out of that. Because if you leave dead people around too long, disease spreads. And so there's that's you know I often said that there's multiple tragedies or multiple disasters that can occur from one, and so disease very commonly would follow. Uh, these sorts of disasters as well, and so that's why you try to retrieve the dead bodies. Um, we're going to come a little bit closer to home. We're going to talk about Banda Aceh when we talk about the tsunami more, but uh, but for now I want to tell you about one that's really close to home for us, even in Missouri, and that is the New Madrid Fault Zone. It's in the boot heel of Missouri. If you're familiar with Missouri geography at all, it's a very flat landscape down there, really rich with agriculture, as is southern Illinois and eastern uh, Arkansas and western Tennessee here and in the northwest and northeastern yeah, northwestern part of uh, Mississippi as well. Very agriculturally intensive area here. And in 1811, before we had photographs again, there was an earthquake in this area in December 16th. So in the wintertime, it was a seven, it's been estimated because this is before seismic uh, say stations were around. It's estimated that it was a 7.2 to 8.2 earthquake. Uh, so a major earthquake in the middle of the United States in the most active fault area of the United States. Now, some people would argue that that active fault zone could actually be stretched all the way into Indiana. But uh, there was another earthquake in January the following year in 1812, estimated to be a magnitude 7 or a magnitude 8 earthquake. And some people think that that was the largest earthquake, in fact. But the next one has the highest estimate of all of them. That's in February of, of 1812. So over the course of three months, there were continuous earthquakes shaking this landscape. Many of the people that lived here. And these were be some of the earliest settlers in this area, Native Americans who lived in this area. They experienced these earthquakes. So this is when it was still a frontier. You know, Missouri wasn't even a state until like 1821. <laughs> this is the centennial for the state of Missouri or bicentennial for the state of Missouri this year. And so in 1811, that's 10 years before it was even a state, the earth shook here with such ferocity that it would shake the buildings here but the buildings here in Missouri were made out of logs at the time. They made log cabins. And so many of the logs would actually roll and kill people. Not too many. Yeah, there's never been a proper estimate of how many people were actually, how many people actually lost their lives in this. But there are some narratives some so that still survive to this day of people that wrote down, yeah, I went into this one area and there was this young girl who was trapped by a log and I had to, I stayed with her until we could get, you know, a team of mules or whatever to pull the log off of her and saved her life that way. That was a guy named John Shaw, I think it was. It was in his memoirs. I got to read them. It was an interesting account of what happened here. There are other accounts as well. I'm going to have some here for you in just a little bit here. But there was a February earthquake. Um, notice at this time it said it stopped clocks in New York City. So we're, uh, we're 1,500 miles away from New York City in Missouri, okay? And in New York City, if you have a pendulum clock and that pendulum is swinging back and forth, that pendulum, because of the swinging or the motion of the earth, it could actually stop that pendulum from swinging. People noted that. It, they say that it rang bells uh, a long distance away as well, so I don't know how far it would rang the bells, but quite a long ways. There are woodcuts of this one as well. That's one of the reasons it's nice to prime you with what happened in, in Lisbon. 
In this case here, you can see the log cabins that are tilting here and people running out. And there were fissures that opened up here as well because that land would open up. And then in fact, you would have what they call sand volcanoes that erupted out of the land surface. They say there was a smell of sulfur in the air. People thought that hell on earth is beginning at this time. And so um, not only that, you know that the Mississippi River runs through that region as well. This is another etching or lithograph from that time period where you can see the waves on the Mississippi River being shunting boats around and things like that, the early river boats, and of course people clutching the logs and things like that. The story is that the Mississippi ran backwards for a short period of time after this earthquake. And in some locations, like in New Madrid, which was the, the seat of government actually at that time, in what we... Uh, would become known as uh, Missouri Territory. Um, it was it was a land that experienced a 20-foot wall of water, a seiche, coming in from the Mississippi River. And so a 20-foot wall of water came in to some of the towns. The earthquakes really can mess things up. Uh, so the river ran backwards for a short period of time. And uh, the other thing that happened at that time, in fact, was... The ground subsided in a few places, and it created a lake, actually, associated with this uh, earthquake. They call it Real Foot Lake. It's in northern Kentucky. And uh, there was a place in Missouri called the Sunk Lands that developed as it. Well, the whole thing just subsided from that earthquake. And so there was a block that just dropped and then became, you know, a wetland after that. I think it's still a wetland today. They call it the Sunk Lands. And Real Foot Rift was a 100-mile long lake. It's not a little tiny thing. Um, so the devastation would have been absolutely dramatic, but there were very few people actually living here at the time. There may have been, at the very most, a few thousand people living here. That earthquake, not only was it felt a long distance away, but even in places like southern Indiana, the the, the the waves were transported to the north there, and it knocked over cabins and drove off livestock, even in southern Indiana at the time. That's, a, that's an amazing story about what can happen. So I'm going to read to you a couple of passages here from this, so pardon me while I look away from the camera here. But this is a story by John Bradbury. He's a, He was in the Linnaean Society. He's a scientist, right? But he was visiting this area collecting plants. So after supper, we went to sleep as usual, about 10 o'clock at night. I was awakened by the most tremendous noise, accompanied by the agitation of the boat, so violent that it appeared to be in danger of upsetting or capsizing. I could distinctly see the river as if it was agitated by a storm. Now, although the noise was inconceivably loud and terrific, earthquakes give off noise, you could distinctly hear the crash of falling trees and the screaming of the wildfowl in the river. And then I saw that the boat was safe uh, at her moorings. By the time we could get uh, to our fire, which had been a large, um, which was in a large flag in the stern of the boat, and they had like a, a stove at back there made out of rock, essentially, that the river was in such a mass of uh, vast masses, so nearly to sink our boat by the swell, uh, they occasioned. And so the, the boat was just sitting there rocking back and forth there on the boat, of course, at the time. At daylight, we had counted 27 shocks. So there was the original earthquake and then a whole bunch of aftershocks afterwards. Um, I'm sure they probably stayed on the boat. It's one of the few safe places to stay, I would think, in this earthquake, as long as you weren't in that 20-foot wall of water. Now, this is a letter that was written by Eliza Bryan. And Eliza Bryan had witnessed this earth earthquake and actually lost a child to this earthquake. Um, now, she hadn't actually lost the child. She had witnessed the earthquake, though. Um, the, the earthquake was actually witnessed by somebody else who was who decided to move his whole family away from Missouri to get to Indiana, and he still felt earthquakes there. So it, it upset a lot of this region. Um, on the 16th of December, 1811, about 2 o'clock, um, 2 a.m., uh, we were visited by a very violent shock of an earthquake, accompanied by a very awful noise uh, resembling loud but distant thunder. 
and, but more hoarse and vibrating and was followed in the next few minutes by a complete saturation of the atmosphere with sulfurous vapor, causing total darkness. The screams of the uh, frightened inhabitants running to and fro. Now, she was living in Missouri at the time in a New Madrid, uh, not knowing where to go or what to do. The cries of the fowls and the beasts of every species, the crackling of trees falling, it even broke the trees off, right? And the roaring of the Mississippi, the current of which was retrograde, flowing backwards for several minutes, owing to its supposed but an interruption in its bed, formed a sense of terrible, uh, truly, that was truly horrible, a scene that was truly horrible. So, I mean, that's the story of, of devastation right here in Missouri from a little known fault zone that could go off again. And so uh, this was a, an account by a guy named Charlie Daniels, not the Charlie Daniels that recently had passed away, not the guy who wrote Devil Went Down to Georgia, but this is a different Charlie Daniels who was actually Secretary of State, the state of Arkansas. He says, actually, the 1811-1812 earthquake continuation was merely a continuation of a series that had included rumblings from 1699, 1776, 1779, 1792, 1795, and 1804. These predecessor quakes were quite possibly even stronger, and some of the changes later created uh, due to the New Madrid earthquake probably had come earlier. In time, the quake was credited with causing the Mississippi River to flow backward and creating the sunk lands in the St. Francis River Valley, and in raising Crowley's Ridge, that's the ridge that runs through south uh, eastern Missouri, and, and creating the Real Foot Lake in Tennessee. It runs from Tennessee into Kentucky. And so that is what happened at that time. He wrote about that in 1994. So I'm going to go back to 1990 with you um, and recount something. Knowing that, so knowing that this area could actually experience massive earthquakes, in 1990 there was a guy named Ivan Browning. He was what we call an actuarial scientist. He would actually, he's very good with statistics, and he thought because the planets were aligning in 1990, you know, Mars and Jupiter and Saturn and so forth, all aligning, he thought that that alignment would actually cause a massive pull on the Earth and that the Earth would then react by having an earthquake. So he predicted an earthquake in 1990 that was going to happen within a few months here. And he says, oh, it's going to be a 6.7 or so, you know, 7.5, 6.5 to 7.5. And because of this planetary alignment, and of course, people being who people are and not knowing geology believed him because he was ostensibly a scientist, an actuarial scientist. He was wrong. And of course, every geologist is like, you can't predict earthquakes. We still can't predict earthquakes. And yet he was predicting one. And so, of course, in this town of New, Dr New Madrid, if you've ever been through there, it's a very small town, very rural town, right on the Mississippi River. And descending upon New Madrid then were all of these satellite uplink tele, uh, trucks and reporters came from all over the United States to talk to Ivan Browning and to interview him and to also interview some of the people that lived in this area. What do you think about this? Well, at the time, they were teaching students how to get under their desk and duck and cover from this earthquake. Now, I'm telling you, that's not a bad idea. When you live in this area, there is a susceptibility to earthquakes. And uh, they, there are some earthquakes that still occur here every once in a while. There are five, threes, mostly on the lower side, right? So nothing that approaches a 6.5 to 7.5 for quite a long time. And so he predicted this, and of course, the month came and went, and nothing happened, of course, right? And that's the... And, of course, all the scientists were saying, I told you so, you can't predict this, but all of the scientists were going, I was like... I hope it just doesn't randomly happen at this time because that's going to make us all look like a bunch of fools and this guy who's a fool make him look like he's a genius. So anyway, it didn't happen. So um, that is the story of the New Madrid earthquake and people are still worried about the New Madrid earthquake today. Here's why. Um, it hasn't had a major earthquake in a long time. And yet there's still a high probability that it could occur within 30 years 
I got to tell you, I heard that 30 years ago, you know, so it's like, you know, does that push that 30 years farther back? I guess, you know, when you look at odds, the trouble is we don't know everything about this fault zone. And people try to predict, you know, what's going to happen and when it's going to happen, but there's no way we can do it with precision. We could only do it as a probability. And so 30 years ago, people said, well, probably within 30 years, there may be an earthquake. And that was in 1990. Well, that's been 30 years since then. So um, is it going to happen? I don't know. And um, so what do you do if it does happen? Well, what could happen if there is a major earthquake of the sort of magnitude that happened back in 1811, 1812, and if all of those other previous earthquakes had occurred with the same sort of level of magnitude, um, we could be in for a whole series of major earthquakes or a series of aftershocks that could affect this place. And it's not just New Madrid, I got to tell you, because the Mississippi River, although it's a major transportation corridor, right? So they send barges and ship traffic up that, mostly barges, right? So large commodities. Those things probably aren't as, at, as much at risk as some of the other things. Every single major highway crosses the Mississippi, too, that connects the East Coast to the West Coast. That's what people are worried about because all of the bridges that are in Memphis, all of the bridges that are in St. Louis, all of the bridges in between St. Louis and Memphis, those are all susceptible to damage. And so if that occurs, things are going to change <laughs> uh, if there is another major earthquake again. Um, let me bring it even closer to home to you. You know, in Springfield, uh, Missouri State University, uh, we built a new basketball arena about 15, 10, 10, 15 years ago, right? So that's when they built the, the JQH. And um, we, before that, we had the Hammond Student Center, right? And so Hammond Student Center was where they played basketball prior to that. They built this beautiful, nice new stadium. And some of the reason why they built that, of course, is because earthquakes are going to displace people, just like hurricanes displace people from Hurricane Katrina. They came to Springfield to escape the effects of that hurricane from, from places like New Orleans and places in, you know, in, in the parishes around New Orleans. I had some students in my class, actually, that were uh, uh, refugees from Katrina. We're going to have refugees in Springfield if there is another major earthquake in the Budio again. So that's one of the reasons why you buy, uh, build these large uh, stadiums in places that are mostly aseismic. And Springfield is mostly aseismic. There are a few, there's only been a handful of earthquakes in the last 20 years in this area. And most of them are like a three. You wouldn't even feel them, in other words. So magnitude three, you're likely not going to feel, unless you're really sensitive. And so um, you get more movement usually from a major truck going up and down your street outside than you would get from an earthquake, in other words. Um, so it could happen. It could happen again. So with that in mind, I just want to give you one more time to look at some of the summary uh, items here. And we've already talked about some of these already. So um, this is that there is a focus with every earthquake. That's where the rupture occurs. Remember the rubber band snapping? the rupture. The epicenter is at the Earth's surface above that focus, and so it's directly above that, in fact, where the Earth seems to emanate, where the earthquake seems to emanate from. And that's what you solve for when you have a whole series of seismic stations. You would look for the epicenter and then know that the focus was down below that. Rocks reach their elastic limit. So normally they are elastic and are able to bend and, and uh, fold a little bit, but the next thing you know, boom, they'll snap and then they release a lot of energy, especially long faults, right? So earthquakes occur along faults, mostly. And so energy is released in this rapid form of waves. Remember, there's four types of waves. We have the P waves, the S waves, the surface waves, which are divided into Rayleigh waves, and then also the love waves. And so um, the Rayleigh waves go up and down. The love waves go from side to side, kind of. Now the P waves go in a push this way, and then the S waves go from side to side to shear waves. And then um, uh, these earthquakes typically can kill people, as you've already seen now. And uh, not only can they kill people, they also can kill, you know, they, they, most of the killing is done from the earthquake unpreparedness that people have. 
buildings kill people. Um, so the earthquake usually itself is not responsible usually for the the death, the, the exact cause of death. It's usually building and debris that falls, uh, that kills people. Well, that's, that's enough for now about what it's like to be in an earthquake. Um, well, I, I gotta tell you, so when I lived in California, I didn't, I experienced one earthquake in all of my time in California. And I saw like, you know, those little, uh, twisty things that you can open up mini blinds with. I was looking in my office and watching that sort of thing go from side to side, you know, maybe swinging 10, 12 inches. Uh, my chair was on rollers and I was like moving back and forth on these wheels on my chair, like the piano bench. Right. And, um, that's all I experienced in 12 years of living in California. I was robbed. Okay. But you know, better that than actually having fatalities. Uh, so that's what you get with earthquakes. Uh, people who worked at the USGS who were involved in the 1989 earthquake told me some of them were driving and they said it's like driving with four flat tires, if you can imagine that. So uh, it shakes you around a little bit, in other words. Uh, some people were caught in buildings and of course they were trying to get out of the buildings. But in fact, one of the safest places to be in a building if you can't escape it, First of all, run outside if you're in an earthquake and get away from the building. Anything that could topple on you, like the brick walls and the outside of a building could topple. But if you are in the building and you know that you can't get out, get under something that's solid, like a desk or get under a table. Something that's not going to collapse if a massive amount of weight hits it. Um, you know, chimneys fall down in these things and things like that. So these structures can fall apart. If you can't do that, stay within a door frame. So the door frame is kind of reinforced uh, a little bit to be able to uh, to keep the wall from falling down in that open space, right? So uh, those are other, other places that you can go uh, to look for safety. Anyway, that's enough for now. And uh, I'll talk with you soon about earthquake processes. So that's coming down the road. I'll give you a short demonstration also of what it's like to see what a, an S wave and a P wave sort of travel like. And so we'll talk about that as well. We'll talk about how fast they travel and all, all that. So anyway, thanks for your, uh, your attention. And um, well, I'll talk to you real shortly here. Thanks. Bye now.